All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is case study session on uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center. Uh, it's about preserving history for future generations. Uh, my name is George Demet. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Palantir.net, a uh, Drupal design development and strategy firm based in Chicago. Um, so let me, before we kind of get into things, let me kind of get a show of hands. Uh, how many how many folks here are uh, are American? Two? Okay, so uh, the rest of you, uh, right. And, and I, I don't actually have a really good sense. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. is a very well-known figure in the United States, but I don't have um, a really good sense of how well-known he is outside the United States. So um, go ahead and raise your hand if you think you have a pretty good knowledge of, of, of who uh, Dr. King is and, and what his accomplishments were, apart from what's on my side. Okay, pretty good, excellent. Um, so yeah, so Dr. Martin Luther King, of course, you know, famous uh, civil rights leader um, in the United States, helped uh, uh, put an end to uh, to segregation in the United States between, uh, you know, uh, African Americans and and whites. Um, Nobel Prize winner, advocate for social justice, assassinated in 1968. In America, what um, and most people in America kind of know these sort of very basic facts about him, uh, but what they don't have as much a good a sense of is really what the core ideals and fundamentals of Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence were. Uh, in Dr. King's birthday is a is a national holiday in the United States, uh, and and it's also considered a day of service. Uh, but in terms of uh, the educational curriculum at schools in the United States, it very often tends to be a very, very brief focus on the civil rights movement. And folks don't really have a chance to get uh, in depth into uh, a very full understanding of who Dr. King was and what he stood for uh, beyond ending segregation and promoting civil rights. So some of the folks who are responsible for helping change that um, are the King Center. The King Center was founded by Coretta Scott King in 1969 uh, after uh, Dr. King was assassinated. Um, it's located actually in uh, Atlanta in the south in Dr. King's childhood neighborhood. The entire neighborhood has been uh, sort of uh, preserved um, as it was during his childhood in the 1930s and 40s uh, as a national park. So when you are when you go to visit uh, the King Center uh, and uh, Dr. King's uh, neighborhood, which includes the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which was a major center uh, of the civil rights movement in the South at that time, um, it's all been preserved the way it is, uh, the way it was when Dr. King was growing up with the kind of classic houses. Dr. King's childhood home is in that neighborhood. You can actually tour it. Um, in addition to the King Center Memorial, uh, which is where um, our client in this case was located uh, and where Dr. King's final resting spot is, uh, his tomb in this reflecting pool here. Um, there's also a uh, exhibit, a large center, visitor center, that's run by the Park Service across the street that goes into um, additional information, detail about the civil rights movement, about Dr. King, um, with lots of really great exhibits. Um, in the King Center itself, um, there's material honoring uh, both Dr. King, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, Rosa Parks, who was another major figure in the U.S. civil rights movement. And what folks don't know about it um, is that it's also the largest repository of primary source material on the civil rights movement uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's actually located uh, on the top floor of this building you can barely see over here to the left. And um, it is literally millions and millions of documents, uh, everything um, relating to uh, letters that Dr. King received, personal papers, uh, papers relating to the various organizations that he was involved in and that the civil rights movement was involved in. Um, and it, they were just there, uh, sitting in the, in the top floor of this building um, in folders. Uh, no one was... Uh, really taking particular care to preserve them. And that's part, a big part of what this project was about. 
The other uh, important thing to know about the King Center, uh, which is run by uh, Dr. King's children, family, uh, and some other uh, folks who are from the Civil Rights Movement, uh, is that they are uh, an organization that's dedicated to spreading knowledge about uh, Dr. King's philosophy around the world. So this project that we were involved in, uh, the Imaging Project and Digital Archive, um, was coordinated by J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase, large American bank and financial institution, has a uh, division called Technology for Social Good. Technology for Social Good is essentially uh, responsible for, they, they find a deserving nonprofit organization, and they kind of bring to bear the full weight of J.P. Cha Morgan Chase's uh, technology consulting expertise. Um, they help fund these projects. This is a, a, a lot of um, really high profile uh, and really well coordinated effort um, with the full weight and backing of one of the largest uh, financial uh, companies in the United States. So the goal of this project was, you know, as I said before, there were all of these documents located uh, in the top floor of the King Center uh, building. Uh, that were just sitting there in, on shelves and folders. So to really uh, preserve them, um, preserve them, archive them, and ensure that they would be around for future generations, and also to make them available online. Prior to uh, this, the only way you could get access to these documents uh, was if you were an academic research who had, a researcher who had gotten kind of special permission to go in and see them. And even if you had permission to enter the archive, you're essentially in a very large room with tons and tons of shelves. They're not very well labeled. You do really don't know where to even find what it is that you're looking for. So we were actually brought into the project uh, by CNG Partners. CNG Partners was the firm responsible for the graphic design on this project. Uh, we're, of course, Palantir.net. We were responsible for the uh, website development. Uh, CNG uh, Partners was doing the design. As I said before, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Technology for Social Good was kind of the, uh, the overall client responsible for coordinating all these folks in collaboration uh, with the uh, King family. So the, uh, when we started the project, the uh, primary contact was uh, uh, Martin Luther King III, uh, who's uh, Dr. King's eldest son. Other folks who were involved, uh, MicroStrategies was responsible for the, uh, the alfresco system uh, that was uh, basically organized, cataloged, all of the information from the digital archive as well as uh, all the metadata. Imaging Etc. is the organization uh, that was responsible for doing the actual digital imaging of the documents. And then we had uh, our other technology partners, uh, AT&T, EMC, uh, who provided uh, cloud hosting for the uh, documents in the archive, and Acquia, who also provides hosting and support for the Drupal site. So to give you kind of a really good visual sense of what it was that uh, uh, this project involved, this is uh, the, the base that was kind of set up uh, right outside the King Center archives. Uh, these are a group of uh, students and volunteers uh, from uh, Morehouse and Spelman, which are the, um, the traditionally, historically African-American colleges in uh, near Atlanta and also the alma mater of uh, Dr. King and uh, his wife, Coretta Scott King. And uh, they had this entire just huge, massive operation uh, that was uh, all centered around uh, pulling the documents out of the archives, going through them, ensuring uh, that they were cataloged and organized uh, in, a, in a way that would make them findable again in the future, uh, that the documents, the physical documents themselves were uh, being preserved uh, with you know, acid-free paper and archival material, uh, that the documents were being scanned, uh, that the metadata was being applied. Um, so there were actually these documents were um, were being reviewed by groups of uh, King scholars, uh, historians, and other uh, researchers who would look at these documents, kind of figure out what they were about, uh, provide uh, abstract as well as uh, uh, keywords um, 
to uh, ensure that folks would be able to know what they were in Fireman. So this is kind of the operation they had set up. Uh, this is uh, an actual digital imaging station uh, they had. Uh, and this was uh, custom created uh, by the folks at Imaging, et cetera. Um, and it was really informed by a lot of work that had been done with um, uh, actually the, uh, the Kennedy Library, uh, which had kind of a few years earlier, it had a lot of similar needs around uh, this sort of preserving massive amounts of uh, documents. So this is an imaging station. Uh, the document would be laid down here on this table in the center. You'd have the camera above that would take the uh, image of the photo, and then it would go into various uh, programs and other stations for processing uh, and, um, and archiving. So overall project goals, um, this was to help the King Center uh, better connect with new generation and improve awareness of uh, Dr. King's philosophy. The, the King Center uh, is an organization that um, that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Um, you know, it's, it's a very well-respected organization because of the involvement of Dr. King's family. They really are uh, the bearers of his legacy, um, but they're not, um, they're not a hugely funded organization. Um, they're, they're, they're a small organization, and they have traditionally had very limited resources for reaching out uh, to, uh, to the wider uh, public. Of course, to provide access to all of these documents that the uh, public has never seen before, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about what they are. And because our assignment was to launch this site um, on Dr. Martin Luther King Day uh, to be able to withstand the massive amount of, of traffic that we were anticipating uh, with a very highly publicized launch. So to step back a little bit and give you a little bit of the history, uh, it, this was about in August of last year late July, actually, uh, I got a call uh, from uh, the folks at, um, at CNG Partners, and uh, they wanted to chat with me about this project. And uh, so I took the call. And when they said what it was, uh, they said, Do you, are you interested? And I said, hell yes. And, uh, then, um, and then we, we, we started talking about the timeline and realizing that this was an incredibly ambitious project that uh, had to be uh, put together in a very short amount of time uh, with a lot of different players, all those different partners, a lot of different moving pieces. Um, uh, but we knew that uh, this was a project that was important enough that we were going to do what we needed to do to make it work. Um, so this is kind of the, the technology stack uh, that, that went into it. Obviously, Drupal was uh, used for the website. Uh, Alfresco uh, was the system uh, that was used to store all of the digital assets. Uh, Atmos uh, was the cloud platform provided by AT&T and EMC uh, that serves all of the images to the website. Um, jQuery and SAS, of course, were our kind of front end technologies. So this next part, I'm going to get a little bit uh, technical, uh, not terribly technical, uh, because quite honestly, I'm, I'm a business guy. I don't fully understand how all of the technology works. But um, I had a few conversations with uh, Arthur Falsch and Beck White, who were two of uh, engineers. Arthur was actually the, uh, the technical lead on this project. And uh, so I think they've given me just enough information to be dangerous. Uh, so if I, if I mangle anything, uh, apologies. Uh, so the archive, the image, the, the all of, after we go through that whole process where all the images are scanned and digitized and all the data is applied and everything, those are managed in Alfresco. Um, are, are you guys pretty much familiar with Alfresco? Who will raise hands? Okay, so Alfresco is um, another open source uh, content management platform similar to Drupal, um, although while Drupal is, a, is optimized for uh, web publishing, and web application development, Alfresco is really designed around uh, document management, uh, asset management, um, that sort of use case. Um, and, and so we knew, because we were working with Drupal, that we would be able to talk with Alfresco. We weren't responsible for the Alfresco implementation. Um, so we, uh, we, we did what we could to make sure that we had a really close connection with that team who was responsible. And I'll cover that in a little bit. So the archive assets, so the actual images themselves that get fed to the website, are stored in the cloud using um, 
AT&T Synaptic Storage as a Service, which is a platform built on top of EMC Atmos. The website, as I said before, uh, is hosted on Acquia's Managed Cloud using uh, the Amazon Web Services platform. And we built the website in Drupal 7 using, among many other modules, views, uh, Zen for the base theme. And on the front end, um, which I'll demonstrate, we had some pretty, uh, pretty heavy needs for uh, interactive uh, functionality. So that involved uh, CSS3, SAS, Compass, and jQuery. So this is kind of the overview document of uh, how things worked. Uh, so we've got, uh, and, and th this, is, this is the one that uh, makes my head spin a little bit, but I'll, I'll do my best to walk through it. Uh, so, so the end user here gets information that's fed to them both from the Drupal website and images that are fed to them uh, through, uh, from, a, uh, from Atmos. So the images live in Atmos. The rest of the website lives in Drupal. Alfresco feeds uh, images to the Drupal site, which then runs them through a queue, creates derivatives, throws them up to Atmos. Uh, we then use the migrate module to pull the non-image, the non-document data, the metadata and whatnot uh, from Alfresco. Once again, run it through Drupal queues, throw it out to the node, then use Drupal to tie these two things together might be asking, why don't you have the uh, image content living on the same uh, server as the Drupal site? Uh, the reason for that is we had access to this fantastic uh, Atmos cloud. Um, the at and folks were providing a tremendous amount of storage. And uh, w this was for scalability. Uh, the uh, number of documents in the archive is uh, around a million. Um, and the, the number that um, we wanted to be able to put online totaled uh, at, you know, a couple hundred thousand. Uh, and so based on, on our storage requirements, we, we knew that putting it on the same, in the same place as the Drupal server uh, was not going to work. Um, so we kept, we kept the Drupal stuff on Drupal, have the uh, images on at and EMC Atmos, and then but then we use Drupal to tie them together and serve them to the user. So just kind of digging in a little bit into uh, the way that we pulled the metadata out of, uh, out of Alfresco. Uh, in this case, we, um, we took the migrate module and uh, we uh, integrated that with uh, Alfresco's CMIS interface. CMIS is the uh, kind of API standard that uh, Alfresco and a few other uh, CMSs uses. It's kind of an open standard. Um, Drupal doesn't actually have a lot of really great support for CMS. Uh, there is a CMS module, um, but for this use case and for the very kind of limited amount of stuff we were doing, and on the advice of the Alfresco team, we decided to um, kind of minimize use of that as much as possible and really uh, lean heavily on the um, on the migrate module to pull stuff in. Uh, this was needed to be very robust because, as you can see, uh, some uh, some documents uh, have over uh, you know, 200 related pages, images, lots of different fields associated with each one. Uh, it also enabled us uh, to be able to um, use, uh, use Alfresco's authoritative place if we needed to, um, to take anything off the website for any reason, uh, if we had a document that went up before it was ready, or if there was some information that was wrong, that can be pushed to Drupal uh, from Alfresco. Drupal queues, uh, and this is this is where where we're kind of testing uh, the limits of my technical knowledge here. But um, we this was essentially used uh, for um, basically generating the images. So we would have the images pulled in, uh, and they would start off in their raw form, uh, somewhere between four megabytes and 100 megas, megabytes. They're being scanned at about uh, I believe 400 DPI, so they're they're pretty pretty large in size. Uh, and then we use the Drupal queues to create uh, derivatives, uh, both um, a primary and a secondary uh, derivative. And uh, we pushed those um, out to the Atmos cloud for serving to the end user. Uh, yeah, in preparation for launch, we actually had to have 12 uh, virtual machines uh, running to generate the derivatives. We, uh, we launched with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 
uh, documents in the archives. So, um, and that all happened in the uh, kind of final two weeks before launch. Uh, so we, we just kind of threw a whole bunch of um, processing power at it. So the Atmos uh, file storage, uh, we created a custom stream wrapper that uh, connected, again, from Drupal to Atmos services. Uh, we tracked the Atmos IDs uh, and then uh, translated that to match the information we have uh, already in Drupal from the, uh, uh, from the information we've pulled in uh, from Alfresco via Migrate. And uh, we had to be uh, very careful about how we set this up. Uh, to, especially during development to make sure that um, while we wanted our, um, our, develop, our, our production environment to be able to, um, you know, to remove images if necessary, we didn't want the staging and development environments to uh, uh, be able to do so. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk kind of about the process and collaboration, um, how we made this work with um, all these different players, all these different technologies to play. Everything was in a state of very uh, rapid development. As I said, we came on at the end of July. We had our kickoff meeting at the beginning of August uh, at the King Center. Uh, we actually were not able to begin production in earnest um, until uh, November. Martin Luther King Day is actually the uh, third week of January. Uh, so we had a very, very limited amount of time to make all of this work for a very, very ambitious project. So having really good project management and coordination was absolutely vital to the success of this project. At Palantir, uh, we use uh, Redmine, the Redmine ticketing system to manage um, uh, our projects and tickets. What we do with Redmine is we actually um, have, um, we expose those tickets not just internally but also to our client. So the client is able to review tickets to see the progress that's going on, is able to comment, is able to create new tickets as needed. Uh, we also shared some of those with uh, some of the other partners working on the project. Uh, we had regular scheduled check-ins uh, between our uh, technical team and the, uh, the different partners, uh, particularly the folks at MicroStrategies, the Alfresco team, uh, and the folks at CNG who were doing the design. Um, those were kind of regularly scheduled progress updates, very kind of simple, you know, identifying what blockers were, how progress was going. Uh, for both uh, MicroStrategies uh, and CNG partners, as well as the folks involved in the overall project management at J.P. Morgan Chase, we had uh, kind of, um, as well as the folks at Acquia, uh, closer to launch, we had kind of uh, back-channel hotlines going. Uh, so if we're working, for example, on something related to the Alfresco CMS integration and we're running into a blocker and we need some question answered, uh, we were able to pick up the phone, call someone over at MicroStrategies and get an answer right away so that didn't uh, block our effort. Um, you know, similarly, if uh, one of the folks from uh, J.P. Morgan Chase wants to know what's going on, uh, how we're doing, get a check-in, in addition to the regular uh, scheduled uh, calls, uh, they can also contact us directly. We also set up, and this is really important, I think, for anyone who's working on a project like this, um, where you've got these, these sort of challenges, is we had weekly executive calls. And these were calls uh, between, uh, uh, between me at Palantir, between um, our, our, our lead project manager at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, and between uh, the, um, uh, the other, um, one of the, uh, the principals at CNG Partners. And this was a, a check-in call, uh, particularly as we got toward the kind of second half, the later stages of the project, uh, where we would be able to deal with issues that uh, had basically bubbled up or escalated and hadn't been dealt with through the regular uh, check-in process so that then we were able to go back to our teams and say, you know what, we really need to take care of this issue because this one is really important. Uh, and, uh, you know, to identify the sorts of things that were necessary for launch. So my next few slides are actually some screenshots of the site, but I'm going to do something that's a little bit dangerous, and I'm actually going to try to show you uh, the pages on the live site, uh, which I, I try to never do in a presentation. but. Um, 
I think it'll give you a little bit of a better experience, a better understanding of, of what this site uh, was like. And if it doesn't work out for any reason, I still have my pretty slides. Uh, so let me, right. oh, there we are. Uh, excellent. So uh, this is the, uh, the home page uh, of the King Center site. Um, we've got a few um, uh, sort of rotating uh, home page features. Uh, we talk about sort of different, uh, different uh, uh, major key stories. Find my mouse here. There we are. Um, I think it would be helpful if we kind of jumped right into the archive. This is a section of the archive uh, on intersecting movements, the way that um, Dr. King worked with and coordinated with a wide variety of different groups who were all kind of attacking the, uh, the uh, problems, and this, uh, the issues faced by the civil rights movement from different perspectives. And uh, so you have a lot of, um, a lot of different information on here. So, so the, the basic view in the archive, the default view is a sort of tile view. Um, this is all kind of randomly generated. Um, you can see when you scroll over, you get some uh, information about um, each, of the, um, each of the items in the archive. So maybe we'll just go to uh, this one. So this is... Oh yeah, if we scroll down, we actually load some more. So this is kind of an endless scroll. Uh, very cool effect. This is all uh, done with jQuery. I'm going to just pull up this particular item right here. Uh, again, this is all using uh, jQuery. There's not a single bit of Flash used on this site. Um, that was really important. Uh, we, um, we have tried it out um, on an iPad. It seems to work pretty well even though that wasn't one of the, uh, the platforms that we were testing for. You can get a kind of a sense here. You can obviously uh, view, uh, view the document, move it around, zoom in, and view, um, view it up close. So I think we're kind of loading in the higher resolution version there. Um, you can view the abstract uh, for the document that just in a very brief uh, couple sentences tells what it's about. Um, you can view, uh, some of these have, um, this particular document doesn't, uh, many of the documents have um, actually transcribed versions, uh, particularly for Dr. King's handwritten speeches. Um, and uh, then we also have um, all sorts of uh, the different um, genre topics uh, and other kind of metadata associated with it so that you can find related information. What's also really cool about this, um, and I will talk about this a little more in relation to launch, are these social media sharing tools, uh, enabling folks to uh, use Twitter or Facebook or other social media to actually link to a specific document uh, and tell their friends about it. And this was something that uh, was really, really cool to watch on launch day. Um, again, kind of going back to one of our major goals, which was to increase public awareness of Dr. King's um, work uh, to provide more than just that kind of very, uh, uh, you know, shallow brief overview that they might have already and to really kind of dig into who this man was, what he did, and what he was talking about. There are some amazing, amazing uh, items in these archives. Uh, in addition to... Um, some of the highlights, I know we have a handwritten uh, version of uh, his Nobel Prize speech. Uh, we have an early draft of the uh, March on Washington speech, the I Have a Dream speech, that doesn't have I Have a Dream in it yet. Uh, we have one of my favorite, favorite things. And maybe we can pull it up. These are really cool. Um, these note cards. So these note cards are actually little handwritten index cards that Dr. King um, had. And these are just little ideas. And he would write these down, and there's, there's dozens of these. And he would just write down different ideas or thoughts 
or concepts that he wanted to think about and to have at his disposal. And he would use these uh, when he uh, was, was putting together speeches and writings. Um, and these are all handwritten by him. These are just sort of amazing things for folks to have um, access to. And it really demonstrates the depth um, of his thinking, not just about civil rights, but about matters of spirituality, uh, the uh, nonviolent philosophy, nonviolence philosophy, uh, ways to bring together um, what he called the beloved community, as well as his major principles. So, jumping back to the slides here. This is actually, right, this is the draft of the Nobel Prize speech. Uh, just one of the really great highlights you can see where he's crossed out things and changed his words. Um, it's really, really cool. And you can kind of get lost in this. One thing I, I forgot to mention, you saw that tile view at the beginning. Um, for folks who are uh, maybe looking for a particular document, we also have really great search tools. Um, and there's also a more standard kind of list view where you can browse content and actually see the information without um, hovering over it. But the, uh, the idea behind the tiles is really to give uh, folks kind of a sense of discovery as they're going through the archive. So launch. Um, we had no idea how much traffic this site would get. Um, what we did know was that there was a lot of publicity planned for it. And we had essentially um, the entire weight of J.P. Morgan Chase's marketing and PR department behind promoting this launch. So we decided to be prepared. And uh, we, uh, we worked with uh, the folks at Acquia, as well as the folks at Suasta, who specialize in cloud hosting. Uh, we ran uh, pre-launch uh, performance testing. Uh, we ran a couple different rounds of it. Um, tweaking uh, every time as we go. We made a few tweaks to the site, uh, made a lot of tweaks to the server configuration to make sure that we could hit our numbers. And we actually ended up successfully testing 25,000 simultaneous simulated users. And so the kind of metric here is basically, what if 25,000 people like all clicked at once on a page on the site? We wanted to be sure that we could handle that kind of traffic. As it turns out, on launch day, we were covered uh, BBC News, USA Today, ABC News uh, was actually mentioned on the evening news. Uh, CNN had uh, both a, a broadcast uh, story on uh, CNN Headline News, also on their website. Um, a whole bunch of different international media outlets talking about it. Uh, Chase.com uh, was uh, promoting uh, the site on their homepage. Uh, they had a... Um, they had a special promotion at Madison Square Garden at the, uh, the Knicks games that were going on that week. Uh, it was uh, in addition to a uh, exhibit booth, which you'll see in a minute, uh, they also had a, um, uh, on the Jumbotron, they were also promoting it. So, uh, you know, so everyone in theory could have uh, tried to pull out their phones and try to access the site at once. So that was something we were looking out for. Uh, and of course, on um, 16,000 Chase ATMs, ATMs, uh, uh, cash machines, or uh, in Germany, uh, uh, Geldautomat. Um, and uh, so they were promoting those on those homepage screens. So we ended up actually serving uh, only about 175,000 unique visitors on launch day, uh, which was um, uh, a couple or a few orders of magnitude below the amount of traffic that we could uh, accommodate. So. Everything went very smoothly. Um, everyone was very happy with the launch. Uh, and because we were hosted um, in the cloud, we were actually able to, you know, after we had done this massive scaling up uh, to get ready for launch day, we were actually able to very quickly and easily scale the servers back down uh, so that we could handle, um, you know, the more kind of everyday amounts of traffic after launch was over. So yeah, this is, this is actually the screen from my uh, local bank <laughs> back home. Uh, this, is, this is the, uh, the message that um, was on the, uh, the ATM screen. So, so that was launched. That was in January. Uh, we took a few weeks off. Uh, we all caught our breaths. And then we started on phase two. 
And um, phase two, uh, which is actually, I believe, in its final throes of development right now and should be launching very soon, um, is share your dream. Uh, so share your dream, um, and this, this goes back to a larger part of the promotion around this effort, uh, was about uh, getting people to engage with, um, with Dr. King's ideas and to engage with the archive and to really um, put themselves out there by writing down their dreams and sharing them. So Share Your Dream will allow folks to submit and share their dreams online. We also have, um, as you'll see, a ton of dreams that, we've, uh, that have already been collected uh, that are going to be, uh, to be uh, shared um, online at launch. And um, this, you know, uh, like I said, ties into the larger uh, initiative to encourage engagement um, and to help uh, provide folks with a deeper understanding of Dr. King's philosophy. So this is um, an exhibit booth. This was uh, created by the folks um, at CNG Partners. And uh, a lot of the, the branding and design and everything really derives from uh, the work that they did for this booth. This, they had one of these. Uh, at um, uh, at Madison Square Garden uh, in New York City uh, before launch, they had one of these set up um, in Washington D.C. Uh, for the uh, unveiling of the uh, um, dedication of the Dr. King Memorial, uh, which went up uh, last August. And um, when you go into the booth, um, you'll see there's this kind of dream wall uh, in the background, and the dream wall. Uh, is where they've kind of physically put up all of these notes with all of these dreams that people have written down as they've walked into the booth and shared them. And uh, this is uh, one of our one of the volunteers here who's manning the booth. You can see she's got all this um, all this paper and notes where you can write down. Uh, you'll get a piece of paper. You can write down your dream. And then what's really cool is uh, so they take the dream and they actually have like a little like simulated digital uh, archiving scanning camera right there in the booth. And so they take the digital image of the booth. And so if you remember, we took a look at, that was the one that was actually located in the King Center archives themselves. This is just a kind of a, a little mini version of that. Um, so it obviously is not capturing things at archival quality, but what it is is it's capturing them um, at a resolution that we can use on the web. And um, so these are the actual designs uh, created by CNG partners uh, for the Share Your Dream feature. Um, so we have a, uh, these note cards. Um, and the idea is that we want folks to be able to take a look at dreams uh, and explore them by a keyword uh, and by geographic regions. So you can kind of see, uh, you know, if, if your uh, you know, dream is about love, you can click on love and you can kind of see all the different places in dreams that people have had about love and uh, you know where they come from. We also have, um, yeah, so this is actually a close-up of one of the dreams. Uh, you can see um, you know, where, using kind of peg clouds, where folks uh, in this region are dreaming about the different ideas uh, that are expressed in here from the transcription that's taken, um, as well as kind of the uh, the, the larger geographical map. So this is where folks in the United States are dreaming about happiness. Um, and so that is, uh, of course, it's, it's simulated. This is all from the, uh, the design comps. But uh, when we launch, uh, we're going to use that information that's been taken from this booth that's been touring around, um, as well as allow people to add their own information online to this feature. So that's the material I have. And so um, if folks have uh, any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer them. I also have a few links to uh, some resources. Obviously, kingcenter.org, um, uh, the uh, case study page on palantir.net where we talk about the project. Follow Palantir on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter if you want. Um, I usually tweet about non-Drupal things, but uh, it's uh, if you want to. Um, and then, of course, make sure you, uh, you rate the session and evaluate it. I'm actually going to be talking about this project at a few other events this fall. And so it would really help uh, for me to understand kind of um, what I hit well, if I 
talked about some of the things you wanted to hear about, if there were things about the project that I didn't talk about that you wanted to hear about. And of course, let me know if you have questions. Raise your hand. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Uh, well, so so we actually um, we close at Palantir between um, between Christmas and New Year, and what we did is we actually timed that uh, along with the client QA period. Uh, so well, well, um, all of our folks got that break. Um, then that was the period uh, during which the folks. Um, you know, uh, on the client side, we're reviewing and submitting QA tickets. We came back at the beginning of January. We had basically a week and a half uh, to address uh, the QA. Um, we um, we did not uh, we did not uh, we had a team on the Palantir side. I think there were probably around half a dozen of us working um, on the project simultaneously. Um, I don't have the, the exact figures. It kind of feels like that, um, just based on uh, my recollection. Um, we definitely had folks who put in long hours um, on this, um, but we um, we also have really we had a really great project manager on the project, and she was really really good about making sure as we went through. And of course, you know the scope of the project did change. You know when we got started, it was you know. This this share your dream functionality was you know originally going to be part of the uh, the uh, original launch scope and you know we we had to cut back a few times in order to uh, you know reach that kind of uh, minimum uh, you know viable experience for launch uh, and um, so we were just really really uh, careful about that um, you know we monitored uh, our burn rates and resourcing and you know the scope very carefully again that was that really direct coordination uh, particularly with the folks um, you know at JP Morgan to make sure that um, we were managing expectations properly uh, and that we weren't going to get into a position where you know someone was going to get in over their heads so um, that's um, yeah, I mean, we definitely had folks who, who put in long hours on it, but um, I think we were, by and large, able to kind of preserve uh, uh, people's Thanksgiving and Christmas pretty well. So, other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much.